James Earl here today, and we're going to be talking about the longest common subsequence problem as well as the longest increasing subsequence problem. Both of these problems have dynamic programming solutions, but because they're so similar, we're going to be talking about them both in this video. I'll explain more later, but for now, let's dive in. So when we're considering the longest common subsequence problem, the first thing I want to share with you is just how similar it is to the edit distance problem. The one key difference is that in the edit distance problem we were transforming string A to string B, but now we're actually not transforming any strings. Instead, we consider two strings A of length N and B of length M, and we're actually looking for the largest set of matching and strictly increasing indices. Okay. So what that actually means is that anywhere in A and B where A at index I and B at index I are equal can be in the set. And we're trying to find the largest set where all of these characters are the same. So let's look at an example. So here we're trying to find the longest common subsequence between strings A and B. Now just looking at them you can see that there's a few common patterns like YX or WX and we're going to take a stab at it and just figure it out without stepping through an algorithm that we're going to discuss later. So for now we can say that the longest common subsequence we can find is YXZ. And you should note that there are other alternate subsequences that have the same length. So we haven't been able to show that there are any longer ones, but there are a few that are of length 3. But how would we calculate this? Similar to the edit distance problem, if there is any strings of any reasonable length, really we can't do this mentally. We could calculate all of the subsequences and find the longest, but again, this is exponential. So instead, we can try to show that there exists a dynamic programming solution. But as always, when we're trying to consider dynamic programming, we must first verify that optimal substructure exists within the problem. So like always, we're going to try to do this through a proof by contradiction. So to do this, we can consider two strings, A and B, where A is of length N and B is of length M. Now let's also consider another string, X. And now let's let X be the LCS of A and B. Given this, we can break down the proof into three different cases. The first claims that if the last characters in A and B, otherwise known as A of N and B of M, are the same, this is going to imply that x of k is equal to a of n is equal to b of m. So the last character in the longest common subsequence is equal to the last characters of a and b. So this will then also imply that x of k minus 1, or the longest common subsequence of length k minus 1, is then a longest common subsequence of strings a to n minus 1 and b to m minus 1. So all we're doing there is chopping off the last character and showing that x is still an LCS. The second case is that a of n is not equal to b of m, so they have dissimilar last characters. This is going to imply that x of k is not equal to a of n. So this means that x of k is an LCS of a to n minus 1 and b to m. So we know that the last character in B is in the longest common subsequence, but the last character A may not be. And the third case is actually just the inverse of the previous case, but instead we're considering that the last character of A is in the longest common subsequence instead of the last character of B. So let's take a look at case 1, where the last character in A is equal to the last character in B. Now consider the last character of the longest common subsequence. If it is not equal to a of n or b of m, then we can simply add a of n, which is the same as b of m, to the longest common subsequence, because these characters are the same. This would give us an LCS of length k plus 1, but this actually forms a contradiction, because we have assumed that x is in fact an LCS. So this completes the first half of this proof. Now we need to approach the second half which is x of k minus 1 is an LCS of a of n minus 1 and b of m minus 1. To do this, we actually use a proof that's very similar to the first half. So let's consider why an LCS of a at n minus 1 and b of m minus 1, whose length is strictly greater than x of k minus 1, the old LCS. Clearly, if we append a n equals b m, the last characters of a and b, to y, it's going to have a length strictly greater than k, but that's a contradiction because we assumed that k was the length of the longest common subsequence of a and b. 
So now we're done case one. So for the second case, we're going to consider when the last characters of a and b are not the same. This is then going to tell us that x of k, the last character of our LCS, is not equal to the last character of a. Remember that we're trying to show the optimal substructure property, so we're going to perform a symmetric proof for b. We can then use this property and say that x of k is an LCS of a at n minus 1 and b of m. Fortunately, this proof is very similar to the second half of case 1. Let's consider some y, an LCS, of a at n minus 1 and b of m. y would then have a length strictly greater than x of k, because if y is an LCS of a at n minus 1 and b of m, y can also be an LCS of a at n and b of m strictly greater than k plus 1. But this implies that x of k is not an LCS of a at n and b of m. This is then a contradiction. So now let's consider case 3, the symmetric proof, where a and b are not equal in their last characters, and the last character of our LCS is not equal to b of m, the last character in b. We can then say that x of k is an LCS of a at n and b of m minus 1. Fortunately, this proof is actually the exact same as case 2, but we switch the variables that are considered. And now we're done. So we've proven that the longest common subsequence problem actually portrays the property of optimal substructure. So now let's walk through an example using the recurrence. Now, when we're considering the recursive formula for this problem, we can define c of i and j to be the longest common subsequence for a to i and b to j. So what that means is up to the ith character of a and the jth character of b. So the first thing we can do is note that there's a row and a column denoted with an asterisk in this table that I've portrayed to the right. And this just represents an extra space that we're going to fill with zeros. So when i equals 0 or j equals 0, we're just going to make this table be 0. Now the next rule we're going to consider is c at i minus 1 and j minus 1 plus 1 when a at i is equal to b of j. So what this means is the ith character of a is equal to the jth character of b. That means that we've found common characters we can include in our longest common subsequence. The final rule then is only applied when a at i is not equal to b of j, and all we're doing is taking the maximum of c at j minus 1, which would be the space to the left in the table, or c at i minus 1 and j, which would be the space above in the table. So let's walk through an example. So if we look at the next available cell in the first row, we can see that we're going to use the third rule and take the max of c at i and j minus 1, or c at i minus 1 and j. But notice that c and i, j minus 1, and c at i minus 1 and j actually hold the same value. It's a 0 to the left and a 0 above, so it doesn't really matter which one we pick. Now if we look ahead four values, we're going to see that this same rule applies for all of them. And because all zeros are going to be placed, we can just pick up or to the left. It doesn't necessarily matter. So we've picked up, and now we're going to consider the next available space. In this case, z and z are the same character, because a at i and b at j match, we're going to use the second rule. c at i minus 1 and j minus 1 plus 1 is the value we're going to put in this for the longest common subsequence. So we fill it in with 1s and diagonal arrows. Now let's take a look at the next row. On this row, we've got the same case. y does not equal w or x, so we can just fill it in with zeros. Now y does equal y, so we're going to take from the diagonal and add 1, using the second rule. See, what happens next is that y does not equal to x, however, we're going to take the max of its adjacent tiles, being to the left or above. Now in this case, they're not the same, so we are going to take from the left, and we're going to create a 1 and add a left arrow here. So for the next few, they're the exact same, and just to be consistent, we're going to only pick up arrows again, because in the case where the left tile and the above space in the matrix are the same, we've just decided that we're going to pick up arrows. So let's take a look at the next row. x does not equal w, so we don't even bother considering any of the other cases, we just take the max of its two adjacent cells. Of course, they're the same, so again, to be consistent, we're just going to add a 0 with an up arrow. 
So x does equal x in this next case. Now we're able to draw from the diagonal and add a diagonal arrow. x does not equal y, so we're just going to take from the largest of the two adjacent cells, and in this case we're just going to take from the top one. Now x does equal x, and we're going to get a new value here. We're going to get a value of 2 because we're drawing from the diagonal where it's already a value of 1. So now, because we've got a 2 here with a diagonal arrow, when we apply the third rule in the next two spaces, we're not going to draw ups because the values are not the same. So instead, we're going to get a 2 when we apply the third rule in this case, drawing left arrows for both. So now that I've walked through a few of the examples, I'm just going to fill in the rest of the table, but feel free to pause and take a look at what I've done to make sure that your work might coincide with my own. Now that we filled in the rest of this matrix by walking through the recurrence, we can see that the longest common subsequence will have a length of 3. But what about the actual solution? Well, this is where placing the arrows in this matrix come in really handy because we specifically don't know what the solution is going to be, all we know is its cost. So by tracing these arrows through the matrix, we can actually construct the solution after we've calculated it. So let's do that. We can see that every time we have a diagonal, that's when we found a matching character, right? So every time we have a diagonal, let's add it to our LCS. We can see by walking through these arrows that there are three diagonals we're gonna take. And in this case, our LCS is YXZ. But remember that there's more than one solution. So it's actually possible to have different LCS of this length, but it's never possible to have more than this length. So now we've constructed the solution from the matrix we built using our recurrence. Now, what about the longest increasing subsequence problem? This is something I mentioned at the beginning of the video, so let's get into it and just compare exactly how similar these two problems are. If we've got an LCS, it's actually the same thing as an LIS, but a minor variation. So in an LIS problem, we're actually considering the values in an array, not just its indices, like in the LCS. So if we have some sequence of digits, like I've put on the screen here, the longest increasing subsequence problem tries to find the longest or largest set of numbers from this set that is increasing in order and in its indices. So an example of this would be 1, 4, 6, 9, 13, 15, or 2, 4, 6, 12, 13, 15, and notice that these are all the same length, and it's the same problem as the LCS. But if there's only one string we're looking for, how can we really say it's the same problem? And the answer to that is actually quite simple, because the longest increasing subsequence problem is just comparing against sequential digits. So if we have the same string we used before, being 2, 1, 7, etc., and we compare that to a string of digits in sequential order from the lowest to the highest in the first string, the longest common subsequence between these two strings is actually going to be the longest increasing subsequence. And that's it. So thanks so much for watching this video, guys. I really appreciate it. Please be sure to like and favorite, and please check out any other videos that we've put up on CS Breakdown for more computer science knowledge.